Hello, my name is Mr. Tom Froze, and these are my thoughts on illustration. This is a bi-weekly podcast about showing up and growing up as an illustrator. Welcome to episode 13. Today we're going to talk about constraints. You know, those pesky things that seem to limit us and even make us struggle a bit when we're making our art. But I can honestly say I love constraints. I embrace anything that helps me narrow the decision-making process so I can more confidently concentrate my attention. Otherwise, I end up getting lost in all the possibilities and spin my tires and ultimately go nowhere. So I naturally seek out certain limits that help me move forward. In this episode, I'm going to talk about how you can use constraints to push you forward in your own creativity. In chapter one, I'm going to share a story about a musician who chose to play a concert even though the instrument he was given was almost unplayable. And we're going to talk about how that became one of the best-selling records of all time. Of course, I'll explain how all this works later in the episode. Then in chapter two, I'm going to explain what this story means for illustrators like us. It turns out there are four types of constraints that can either push us forward or stop us in our tracks. My hope is that by the end of this episode, you'll find yourself inspired to be more creative, not in spite of constraints, but because of them. As always, if you like what you hear in today's episode, you can support me by following me and rating and reviewing this podcast wherever you happen to be listening from. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe and let me know in the comments about how this episode helped you today. You can also support me on Patreon where you can get exclusive access to my live monthly drawing meetups and more. Join today at patreon.com slash tomfroze. Another way you can support my podcast is by going to tomfroze.com to join my mailing list. Just scroll all the way to the bottom of my homepage to sign up. Chapter one, the Cologne concert. The day was January 24th, 1975. Renowned American jazz pianist Keith Jarrett was booked to play the first ever jazz concert at the Opera House in Cologne, Germany. The show was sold out, filling all 1,400 seats in the building but all the odds it seemed were against Jarrett playing this show. Jarrett was tired. He had chronic back pain to the point of having to wear like a back brace, and this caused him several sleepless nights on his European tour. On top of this, he just performed a few days earlier in Zurich, Switzerland, and he had to travel the five-hour or 350-mile journey by car to Cologne with just a few hours to spare before showtime. If that wasn't enough, the show itself wasn't set to begin until 11.30 p.m., as that was the only time the concert promoter was able to negotiate with the venue. Now, if all this wasn't enough, the piano that Jarrett selected for the concert never made it to the stage. He requested a Bosendorfer 290 Imperial Concert Grand Piano, a big, beautiful, lovely sounding piano. But what he got instead was a baby grand they found backstage, and it was in a pretty bad state of neglect and disrepair. There was some kind of a mix up when making arrangements with the opera house staff. By the time they realized the confusion, it was too late. There was absolutely no time left to have a suitable piano delivered for Jarrett to play. The backstage piano, this kind of damaged, disrepaired one, required several hours of tuning and adjustments to make it barely playable. The instrument had a bad sound across the board, but especially in the upper and lower registers, making tinny and thin high notes and weak bass notes. And the the pedals, they didn't even work properly. Jarrett almost refused to go through with the concert. Vera Brandis, the concert promoter, he was responsible for the whole evening. He somehow convinced Keith Jarrett to stick with it. He said, why don't you have some dinner? 
I booked you a spot at a nice Italian restaurant nearby. You'll feel better. Well, guess what? There was a mix-up with the waiting staff at this Italian restaurant, which caused a delay in getting Jarrett's dinner to him on time, and he was only able to get a few bites down before he had to get back to the venue in time for the concert. Professional that he is, though, Keith Jarrett ultimately showed up and he played the concert on an empty stomach with intense back pain, sleep-deprived, and with a barely playable instrument at his fingertips. In spite of the janky sound of the instrument and the malfunctioning pedals, Jarrett gave his audience over an hour of one of the most highly regarded jazz performances of all time. In fact, to this day, the recording from the Köln concert remains the best-selling jazz piano album in history. Jarrett could never recreate that magic, the magic that happened that night, and none of it could have happened if things had gone his way. Whether it was his mood that night or the atmosphere in the opera house or perhaps something that in the two bites of lasagna he was able to scarf down before the show, maybe there was some kind of something in that, one thing was clear. It was because not in spite of that crappy backstage piano that his performance that day made history. An interesting point about the piano he'd ordered for the concert, the Busendorfer 290 Imperial Grand, it had 97 keys. Typical pianos have 88. Jarrett had been expecting one of the most prized pianos in the world, and instead what he got was basically a toy by comparison. It would be like asking for an iPad Pro, but getting an Etch-A-Sketch. In one account of the concert, the, the writer concludes by saying, in the end, the less than perfect piano, which Jarrett initially thought was his worst nightmare, turned out to be a blessing and a boon, rather than a curse. Such are life's little ironies. Now, while they got it mostly right, I believe the writer was wrong about the irony part. There's nothing ironic about the fact that the biggest constraint of the evening became the most important factor in what would later become a highly acclaimed performance. Would it have been possible for Jarrett to perform a beautiful concert that night if he had the instrument of his choice to play? Of course, there's no question his performance would have been spectacular. That's what he was there to do. And that's what sold all 1,400 seats in the building prior to the event. People were expecting nothing short of amazing. But what might have been just another masterful yet ordinary recital became the proving ground for the musician's true mastery and a concert that was nothing short of extraordinary. You see, creativity doesn't happen in the absence of constraints. It happens when we rise to them. Keith Jarrett could have called it in that night, but he rose to the occasion, perhaps at first reluctantly, but he ultimately showed up and gave the performance of his lifetime. Creativity is not the absence of constraints. It's how we solve problems in spite of them. And often it's how we solve problems because of them. Now, this is just one story of constraints, and of course, it's not exactly related to illustration yet, but there are actually four kinds of constraints, as I mentioned up top, that I want to talk about, and these are the kind of constraints that we as illustrators will run into, and I want to talk about how we can use these to push us further in our creativity. But first, I want to take a minute to thank you again for listening or watching to this episode. It means a lot to me that you're here. But I also want to ask you a favor. If you find any of this content helpful, it would be amazing if you could please write a review in Apple Podcasts. I want to remind you that I welcome all reviews, both critical and positive. They all help me make better content for you. I made a lot of effort to make this episode more focused and easy to follow, and it's all because some of you took the time to give me your honest, critical feedback. All right, let's get on with the rest of the episode. Chapter 2, The Four Kinds of Constraints, 
In the story of the Köln concert, the jazz pianist Keith Jarrett ran into a very specific kind of constraint. This was an unexpected turn of events or what we would call a setback. The constraint was never expected nor planned and had he had the choice, it simply wouldn't have happened. He would have had his Bosendorfer 290 Imperial Grand and the concert would have likely gone as smoothly as ever. What the story demonstrates is that true creativity shines when it encounters such setbacks. We might be able to say, true creativity always finds a way. And I think this is true. But I think this speaks to just one specific kind of creativity, which is more improvisational. There's usually a time constraint involved, and you have to make things work under pressure. The threat of failure in these kinds of situations is real. There was a whole audience counting on Keith Jarrett to give them a great show, just sitting there in their seats that they paid to be in. To fail for Jarrett would cost him at least a lot of embarrassment, and it might even tarnish his reputation. But under all the strain and stress leading up to that performance, his creativity found a way. Now, as illustrators, we certainly encounter setbacks in our work at least some of the time. Maybe not as dramatically as it happened in the story that I told you, but painful nonetheless. But the setback is just one of the four types of constraints that I'm going to talk about where it comes to our art. My hope is that we can learn how to identify different constraints, embrace them as much as possible, and sometimes even set them in place on purpose all with the belief that if we use them in the right way, they can help us push forward in our creativity. Now keep in mind, friction is a constraint that can either hold us back or give us the force we need in order to push forward. This is just like how a car needs rubber tires to push back on the pavement so it can move forward and so it can also stay in control. If the tires were made of something smooth like metal, they'd probably have too little friction and we'd find it hard to get the car moving at all. But we also wouldn't get very far if the wheels were square instead of round. Finding our constraints is not meant to hold us back, but to help push us forward. As you might know from previous episodes of this podcast or from my Skillshare classes, I love constraints. I embrace anything that helps me narrow the decision-making process so I can more confidently concentrate my attention. Otherwise, I end up getting lost in the possibility and I spin my tires and ultimately go nowhere. So what I end up doing is I naturally and very purposefully seek out constraints. These are things that can keep me on track and actually give me something to push against. So now let's go through the four creative constraints that I think we'll all run into as illustrators. So just real quickly, these are external constraints, internal constraints, the constraints that we choose, and then the constraints that choose us. So let's start with external constraints. External constraints are those that come built into a project. They're external because they come to you from the outside. This is usually from your client. These are the most basic or obvious constraints that every illustration job needs, and they're usually defined in the brief. These are things like dimensions and resolution and file format, but also all kinds of other things that the client will want or need that you'll ultimately have to include or consider in your art. I don't think anyone would argue that these kinds of constraints are that they're no one's going to argue that they're bad or hurtful to a project is what I'm trying to say. While we may be oozing with creative juices, we probably crave some kind of starting point like this to get us going. We need to have some kind of initial problem to solve. Illustrators are first and foremost creative problem solvers. In the beginning of a project, it's really important to understand what kind of problem we're supposed to be solving and what our limits and boundaries are. Sometimes we get these things very clearly written into a brief and sometimes they aren't handed to us very clearly at all. We have to push and probe to get all these kinds of things out of the client. Now, I've had projects that have had too few external constraints, and I've had some that have had too 
many, and of course, neither of these situations is ideal. In episode 6, I told you the story of the hamburger restaurant client and how the brief was way too open for me. They wanted to make some illustrations to go up on their walls, but other than that, I had no sense of what the illustrations would be about. I needed some kind of friction to push forward on. So I worked with the client to define the problem or intention for the project as clearly as possible. Even though it was enough for them to just want cool art up on their walls, as long as it was made by me, which is great, I couldn't be absolutely sure I could make something they'd love until I knew more about what they might mean. What do they mean by cool art up on the walls? Now that I remember it, I also really had to push them on even just basic things like what the dimensions needed to be and even how many different pieces they wanted. You can listen to episode 6 for the full story, but it ultimately ended well, and I think it was because I was able to push the client to get me more of those built-in constraints and the client was pretty cool and they were willing to work with me to get there. Now, sometimes it's possible to have too many constraints. There have been many times when a job comes to me and the client not only tells me what they'd like me to illustrate, but they've even given me a sketch to work with. I consider coming up with ideas and sketches as my job. My job is to understand what the client's problem is and to solve it in my own unique way. That's the value I bring as an illustrator. My ideas are as fundamental to my work as the style I work in. Now, when a client gives me their sketches in this way, all is not lost. I try not to panic. The first thing I do is I ask whether they need me to execute their sketch or idea exactly or if they want me to try other options as well. And usually they're okay with me actually providing some additional ideas too. This is just part of finding where the limits in the job are. Often the client just needed to use pictures because it was easier for them than trying to do so in words. And so I think it's okay for us to use client-provided uh, sketches or their doodles just as a starting point. But sometimes a client will come to me with a concept or sketches that have actually been approved by their client. And in these cases it is a little bit more constricting. And this actually happened to me a while back when I worked on uh, some illustrations with an ad agency for one of their clients. The art director had already come up with what they wanted me to draw and it was approved by their client and they really just wanted me to draw it or illustrate it out in my own style. Now, because I see my job as being creative and providing innovative creative solutions, I didn't just do what they asked, I did go above and beyond. In the concepts that I sent back to my client, I included one version where I redrew their ideas in my own style, just like what they asked, but then I gave them more explorations that added more to their ideas. These were ways in which I developed their ideas to have more personality and humor in my own way, and lo and behold, they ended up going with my ideas instead. If you're interested in learning more about the, the details of this particular situation, I actually talk about it as an example in Lesson 8 in my Skillshare class, The Six Stages of Illustration. And of course, I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. All of this is to say what at first seemed like a hard limit on my creativity ended up just being a starting point even though the overall direction of the art couldn't be changed, I was able to find a way to do my own thing and to provide extra value and feel like I was doing something more creative than just drawing someone else's sketch in my style. Either way, setting up those first external constraints is super important and it's fortunately usually pretty straightforward. You just ask the client what they want and what they need and how they intend on using the art that you give them. From there, you can get into the details like dimensions, file formats, colors, messaging style, and everything else. The big takeaway here is that external constraints are not just these pesky things we have in the way of our creativity, but the very thing we have to sink our creative teeth into. The limits and boundaries that define our brief ultimately give us the problem 
that we can in turn solve in our own unique creative way. Now let's talk about internal constraints. Internal constraints are the things that we bring with us wherever we go. Rather than being built into the project, they're built into us. In my style class, I largely talk about these things in terms of our abilities and proclivities. What are the things we can do and what are the things we want to do? What are our skills and what are our interests? We can use these things, our abilities and our proclivities, to guide us in deciding how to approach a job and what kind of jobs to take on in the first place. So these have both positive and negative connotations. In the positive sense, knowing what we can and want to do in terms of our skills and abilities helps us know what we can bring to the creative work. For instance, if you're really good at painting realistically, you might want to use that as part of your style which then becomes how you most often approach your work. And in turn, the fact that you are a realistic painter will also define what kinds of jobs you can take on and that will come to you in the first place. In the negative sense, knowing what we can't or don't want to do can help us know what we can't bring to the table and probably shouldn't put forward as a possibility to our clients. For me, I'm definitely not a realistic painter, and so I obviously know that whatever my clients want from me, they're not going to get a lifelike scene or portrait. But this also creates an interesting opportunity for me to approach projects in an unexpected way. I find that a lot of my early process is about figuring out this question. How can I interpret this project or brief in my own way? If a client is asking for an interior scene, for instance, where usually one will think about 3D space and perspective and lighting, I ask, how can I, with my very flat and graphic style, enter into this problem? Suddenly, I have my own stylistic problem to figure out within the larger problem given to me by my client. I'm able to focus in on this particular constraint and work out how to represent a space in a more flat way. And in this way, I find workarounds that end up becoming parts of my overall style. So much of our style is actually defined by the things we can't do. I'm able to use my weakness that I don't illustrate in a realistic way into a strength. I can illustrate scenes and spaces in a surprisingly flattened way. If you've ever looked at someone's style, perhaps in how they represent 3D objects in a wonky or very flat perspective, very often that's just how they work around not being very good at or maybe not very interested in doing perspective in the right way, so to speak. Last year, I spoke on stage at the Design Thinkers Conference in Vancouver. My talk was about how to find work you're best at doing. As a sort of icebreaker and object lesson at the beginning, I had the whole audience participate in a singing experiment. Not exactly being a choir director, I questioned my life choices as I walked to the podium to begin my talk. But it turned out beautifully, and I think this really illustrates my point here. What I did was I asked the audience to help me sing a four-part chord. Each of us needed to find our note. So in this note, there were four notes. There was the bass, the tenor, the alto, and soprano notes. And so I had the audience sing through each of the notes together. We all sung together, first bass, then tenor, then alto, and then soprano. And I had people sort of pay attention. If you felt the most comfortable singing the bass over all the other notes, that's probably your note. And then once we all figured out our parts, we were able to sing this beautiful four-part chord. I scream. Without me, I want to hear it. More soprano. That was so good. (laughs) This is a perfect analogy for finding our voices as artists. There are some things that are in our range, and then there are other things that are not in our range. When we find what our vocal range is, we can then know better how to use it. Just as a bass singer will know not to audition for a soprano part, 
a more graphic style illustrator such as myself will likely avoid projects requiring painterly realism. Now, if you'll remember from the story in chapter one, that scrappy piano that Keith Jarrett used or he had to use had a very limited range. Even though it had all the keys a normal piano does, its sound coming from the lower and upper registers was very weak. It had really shallow bass in the lower notes and the top notes higher up the key- keyboard were quite thin and tinny. The strongest part of the piano was more in the middle keys. Now being sensitive to this, Keith Jarrett focused most of his playing in the middle part of the piano and whenever he had to use the lower or higher notes, he used specific techniques that made it sound better. In effect, he found the vocal range of the instrument and he made sure he used it well. The takeaway here is that we come to all jobs with certain limitations, some of which might feel like a setback. But if we can find some narrow area of strength, we can focus just on that. We can say, I know that my range is pretty limited, but how can I make the most of it? Just like Keith Jarrett found a way to make the most out of the middle range on the piano, where the strongest sound was coming from, we can look at ways of using whatever limited range we find ourselves with and see how far we can push it. Now, so far, the constraints we've talked about are largely outside of our control. These are things that we simply have to work with because it comes built into the brief or because they come built into our own abilities in some way. The choice we have there isn't so much in the constraints, but in how to leverage them for the most creative result possible. Now I want to talk about constraints that we choose on purpose. And this might be my favorite constraint to talk about. This episode came from thinking about composition, which, as you know, I've been having a hard time talking about. But I asked my wife, Amanda, who tends to think much more clearly and simply about these things, what she would give as composition advice. One of her tips was to keep things simple, or in other words, to have constraints. Now, Amanda is a designer, and I think designers tend to think more consciously of constraints because their work just is more directly about problem solving, so constraints more naturally fall into the job. Illustrators, though, we we tend to be more artsy-fartsy, and so maybe a lot of us feel more comfortable creating without needing to know what their limits are. But because I'm such a lover of constraints, this is probably why In some senses, at least, I'm more of a designer than an illustrator, but I digress. So when I was talking about composition with my wife, I think what she meant about having constraints was that we have to limit ourselves to just a selection of elements to work with. Her example was in using just two typefaces instead of a whole bunch and limiting ourselves to just a few colors in our color palette. The designer's job is to define what these constraints are before beginning to actually create the layout or whatever it is. Of course, the hard part is deciding what those constraints should be and why you, why you would do them. Like, how do the constraints you choose, the colors or type or whatever, relate to the brand or idea or message? But in the end, you choose them. The designer voluntarily sets them in place. And then once they do, they can focus on how to use them to build up their idea or reinforce the message or whatever, you know, whatever the the job at hand is. For illustrators, the biggest way in which we choose our constraints is in our style. And this is just such a huge topic, but generally speaking, our style is in what our work looks like. What kind of colors do we work with and what kind of textures and what kind of shapes What do the lines look like? And the way in which we use these things consistently over time becomes our style. And more broadly speaking, our style also includes the kinds of things that we bring into our work. Like maybe we factor in a lot of patterns or abstract symbols, or we like to draw animals or people a lot. Like in my work, I often illustrate a lot of figures or characters and that has become a part of my style. Our style also has to do with the details that we give our drawings, like what shape 
are the eyes in our characters or how do we draw hands and stuff like that. I could go on about this, but I think you get my point. Style is a constraint in the sense that there are certain ways in which we illustrate things and other ways in which we don't or can't. But even though style is in many ways an outpouring of our natural abilities or non-abilities, it's also something we choose on purpose over time. As part of this, we also end up choosing our tools and techniques. Just the fact that you're either a digital artist or someone who works with physical paint and paper is a choice of constraints. Constraints, in this sense, are like rules that we make for ourselves, almost like rules of a game. If you decide to work only in red, white, and blue, then you'll have to make this very strict constraint work in every illustration. The design duo Crispin Finn holds themselves to this exact constraint, and if you look at their work, you'll see just how much is possible with so few colors. And you also see how strong of an identity this gives all their work. In previous episodes, I talked about how I started off my career using letterpress printing as the paradigm for my style. By that I mean I always made my illustrations as though they were going to be printed using letterpress printing techniques. Letterpress printing has very strict technical limitations. You can only print one color at a time and colors can only be solid. There's no half tints, gradients, or blending. The ink is either going down all the way or not at all. Letterpress is great with flat shapes and tight, but not so great with intricate art and subtle details. So even though I worked digitally and theoretically I could have used millions of colors and thousands of different shapes and brushes and subtleties, I chose to pretend that I couldn't. I chose to pretend that all I had to work with was flat shapes and as much as possible just two or three solid colors plus a bit of texture as long as it looked like it could be printed on or by a letterpress printer. But it was by this constraint that I was able to develop a clear, consistent, identifiable style as an illustrator and having to present different kinds of ideas within these rather strict rules often created more interesting results. Style, of course, is a huge topic and probably deserves its own mini-series of episodes. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about how I approach the question of choosing a style, I have a whole class about it called the Style Class. You can check it out. I'll leave a link to it in my show notes. So yeah, the question of how to choose your style is a much larger conversation, but there's so much creative power in having to make just a little do a lot. When we come into a project knowing what the limits of our style are, like what are the basic elements we have to work with, we can just jump right into using them to solve the problem at hand. The more we work within a style, the more we know what it can do, and the more we know how to get the most out of it. The takeaway here is that there are some constraints that we must choose as illustrators, and these usually come in the way of style, tools, and technique. These can also come in the way of the kind of subject matter we like working with and the details that we put into them, such as how we draw eyes and hands. Stylistic constraints can be set across the board as our more singular way of approaching all illustrations, or we can set them per project. Some of us are going to prefer to work in one style all the time, and others are going to be okay with working in different styles depending on the project. The important thing is to set some kind of rules for what you can and can't do, and that will give your work more consistency, whether that's across all of your work or just within a project, and it's also going to force you to find workarounds that will ultimately lead to more interesting solutions. So we started this whole episode with the story of a huge setback. Instead of being the kind of constraint that we choose, this is an example of the kind that chooses us. In our story, Keith Jarrett didn't want to limit himself to that crappy piano. It just showed up and he had to work with it. And just like he had to make the best of what he had that night, we often find ourselves faced with less than ideal circumstances in our projects. Now for me, having to work within the constraints of letterpress printing is a dream. I love how these limitations force me to focus in on certain ways of making images. Because I 
have a lot of experience working with letterpress. I'm very much in my element. But for others, this might be a nightmare. Like maybe you're a painterly realistic illustrator who suddenly has to work in letterpress. And in such a situation, I wouldn't blame you if you felt quite out of your element. At the same time, I think it would be a fascinating challenge for a painter who can work with subtleties and blended colors however they want. If you're used to that, what would happen if that was taken away from you? How would how would you approach a letterpress print where you have to work with just two to three solid colors and you can't mix things on a palette? The constraint makes for a highly interesting creative challenge, which if the painter is up for it, it could result in a highly creative result. Now, setbacks can come in the way of unfamiliar or unexpected requirements at the beginning of a project, like, you know, if you have to work with letterpress constraints or if a client gives you their sketches, but they can also come in the way of some kind of unwelcome surprise, like what happened to Keith Jarrett in the Colm concert. But they can also come when we feel like we don't have exactly what we need to do our job. Now, I've never mentioned this before, but long before I had illustration or even design on my mind, I wanted to do photography. I wanted to take pictures. I was super into it, but I didn't have a very good camera and the idea of buying one or even getting good film and paying for the processing fees felt like it was way too out of reach. So instead of taking pictures, I usually just did nothing. I didn't take pictures very often at all. And when I did, I wasn't very happy with them. Maybe if I took more pictures, I would have gotten more practice doing so. But my excuse was eventually when I get a better camera, when I can afford the processing fees, all those kinds of things, then I'll be able to take better pictures. When this condition is met, when I get this gear, then better things will happen. Then I will be more creative. In the end, I actually did get a better camera, but I didn't end up doing a whole lot with it because the conditions just never seemed favorable enough. I actually wrote a whole song about this that I'm honestly debating whether I should sing for you or not sometime, but for now, I'm just going to stick with the talky stuff. But my point here is that I've always had this tendency to believe that my true creative potential can only be realized once certain ideal conditions are met. Once I get the good camera, I'll be able to take good pictures. Once I get an iPad, I'll be able to make better art. The only way I'll be able to reach my true creative potential is by having the right tool. Now, while of course, the right tool for the job can make all the difference, not having the right tool can force us to be more innovative and creative. Back in the early days as an illustrator, I didn't have an iPad or an Apple pencil. I didn't even have uh, like a, a Wacom tablet. Even though I illustrated digitally, I had to start everything on paper. I used an HB pencil and printer paper for my sketches and for my brushes and lines and textures. Because I couldn't use my mouse to control digital brushes in Photoshop, I just used paint brushes and black ink to create the textures and marks and lines on physical paper. And I would scan these into my computer and then I'd have to try and piece them together in Photoshop. And while the process was rather tedious, there was a lot of creative magic that came out of having to make it all work. So much of my process at that time was about improvising, about seeing how one paint stroke could be used in many different ways throughout a piece because I didn't want to have to go and make another paint stroke on paper and scan it into Photoshop again. So much of the creative process was just about how to use one large texture that I made to make the overall piece feel like it was made by hand. Now, I did believe that if I had a Cintiq or an iPad, I would be able to control all the parts in my work more, and that would make me a better illustrator, and that would help me become more creative. Now, eventually, I did end up getting a graphics tablet set up, and indeed, I do work a lot faster, and I can even get more detailed and precise in my work. But this whole increase in my technical ability also changed my style altogether because I no longer had to work with all these separate bits that I made using physical media. My work became less improvisational. I'm definitely happy about my style and how it's evolved today. 
And I think it's stronger than it used to be. And I, I truly believe, and I'll admit, that this has been made possible only through having better technology. But I also have to wonder, what could have happened if I never got the iPad? How would I have evolved my more analog-based techniques? What interesting workarounds would I have had to develop as my projects became more demanding and complex? Of course, I'll never know the answer to this, but I can say that even though I'm super proud of my work today, I used to pride myself on being able to work with less in my older style, and I've lost that. There was a certain excitement in just not knowing how things were going to come together in the end. Every project was a new adventure, and I kind of miss that part of the process. So yes, it's true. Setbacks can be devastating and thwart all creativity completely, but we often blame our constraints for our failing to show up. We tend to blame our clients for holding our hands behind our back or for giving us too many restrictions. You know, maybe they come to us with their own sketches and we feel like we don't have any wiggle room to come up with our own ideas. Or perhaps we make excuses for ourselves for not making more art because we don't have the right gear or supplies. And sometimes we blame outside circumstances like those that seem to conspire against Keith Jarrett that faithful January night in Cole. While it might be hard to admit, so often the real setback is inside of us. When I think about Keith Jarrett's performance, I think about how entitled he would have been to cancel the show. There were a lot of setbacks that night and he had every reason to cancel it, but I'm so inspired by how he showed up anyway and how he made the most of what some might have seen as an impossible situation. While on the outside, it seems that he truly had no creative freedom. The real creative freedom he had had nothing to do with his external conditions that night. The real creative freedom was inside of him. And that's the big takeaway that I want to give you here. If we can see the setbacks in our work as creative challenges, we might find ourselves being more creative than we ever thought possible. So we're just about done, but I just want to quickly summarize what we talked about today. In chapter one, I told you about the story of the Cologne concert, where nothing seemed to go right for the musician Keith Jarrett. But instead of ruining the show, these setbacks created the conditions that made the recording of that concert an all-time best-selling album. Then, in chapter two, we went through four types of constraints we encounter as illustrators, and these include external constraints, which come built into each job we take on. External constraints are mostly just the basic things we need to know about a job before we get started, like what the work needs to be about and what the dimensions should be. It's possible to have too little constraints, too few constraints, in which case we need to push our client to give us as many details about their needs as possible. On the other hand, it's possible to have too many constraints, such as when a client gives us their sketches, leaving us very little room to be creative. In such a case, we can use their ideas as a starting point for further exploration in our own way. The next kind of constraint we went through is internal constraints. These are the kind that come built into us. These are the limits that we bring to every single job and have more to do with our abilities and proclivities. We can use what we're good at and like to help us determine the best way for us to approach a given project. And we can also use what we're not good at and which we don't want to do to help us know what kind of projects we shouldn't take on or what we won't by choice take on. The third kind of constraint is the kind that we choose. These mostly come in the way of our chosen tools, techniques, and style. Developing a style really is just in making rules for what we can and cannot or will and will not do in our work, such as like how many colors we use and which ones and which app or media do we like to work with. With these kinds of constraints, we're forced to use less and do more. And this always pushes us to come up with more, dare I say it, out of the box ideas. And finally, there are the constraints that choose us. 
These are the kind that our hero in chapter one encountered, and these are the setbacks that come our way at some point during the process. Though they are seldom welcome at first, they can prove to be the magic that pushes our work further than we ever thought possible. Of course, the true hero in the Colin concert story isn't the constraint at all, but in the artist. There's nothing creative about a crappy musical instrument any more than there is in a broken iPad or an unsharpened pencil. These are just objects. The true creative element is in how the artist found a way to work with the constraints. This required sensitivity to the reality of the moment and the ability to improvise and to use the limited means available to him in that moment, all the while keeping in mind the overall goal of that night to show up and give the audience the performance they came to see. When we show up to create and find ourselves faced with unexpected limitations, it takes a lot of gumption to keep going anyway. To choose to show up anyway is to say, even though things seem stacked against me, I have a job to do and I'm going to find a way to do it. Yes, it takes faith and courage and probably a delusional sense of confidence to believe we can actually rise to the occasion. But so often, when we find ourselves in these situations, we can really end up surprising ourselves. Sometimes, we even do our best work. Maybe we had to do a lot of work within an impossible timeline, or maybe we were given impossibly contradictory directions from our client, or maybe we decided for ourselves to constrain our style in some way. Whatever it was, creative magic seems to need the threat of impossibility in order to happen. Our creativity needs some kind of constraint to happen at all. Because creativity isn't the absence of constraints, but how we solve problems in spite of them. My name is Mr. Tom Froze, and those were my thoughts on illustration. You can find links to all my things at tomfroze.com, including my Patreon, YouTube channel, and Skillshare classes. Remember to rate and review, like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends, and all those lovely things. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. I'll see you in the next one. The music for this podcast was written and performed by Mark Allen Falk. You can find links to his music in the show notes or go directly to his link tree at linktree slash semi-athletic. This podcast was written and performed without the aid of artificial intelligence. Adobe Podcast AI was used to improve the sound and I used Lenza, an AI-based photo app, to adjust the lighting and stuff like that in the YouTube thumbnail photo. This episode was produced by me, Mr. Tom Froze. Special thanks to my script editor, Jules Herrick, who really helped me refine this episode. And of course, thanks to my audio video engineer, Mark Allen Falk.